My name is James. I'm a veteran and I work for Combat Stress, the veterans' mental health charity. On behalf of all of those who have taken part, I'd like to introduce their film, which marks the centenary anniversary of Combat Stress. This film was made by UK veterans with mental health conditions, including post-traumatic stress disorder. They made the film with UK reminiscence charity Age Exchange and was supported throughout the process by Combat Stress. The veterans were candid, open and showed great courage in coming forward to tell their stories. Please be aware this film contains uncompromising and often upsetting descriptions of combat and trauma related events, as well as the realities of living with a serious mental health issue. If you are a veteran or a family member and are affected by this film, call the Combat Stress 24 hour helpline on 0800 138 1619 So there are a lot of really difficult situations to to observe and to be part of and I particularly remember the Whenever children were involved, that was, uh, that was particularly difficult. Me leaving the army, it, it was just a complete body blow to me. One morning, I was in the army in charge of a, I don't know, multi-million pound heli fleet. And that night, I was sat in my mum's and I wasn't in the army. I knew there was things wrong, right? But I was in such a... I, I'd isolated myself from my friends, my family. I have to relive it every day, every night, and it's... I got in touch with Combat Stress for a friend and I learned I weren't alone. So 2016 he went to work in Germany. Um, as I say, it was a breathing spot for us. We were able to, to rebuild our lives, still have them but apart. Um, he by this time was finding it very difficult. He didn't feel as though he belonged anywhere, didn't feel as though he was worth anything. He'd seen the cracks. He was starting to realise the damage that had been caused to our family. By this point, uh, Daniel had started sixth form, brand new sixth form, brand new set of friends. So you probably felt it, the move the worst because of the time we were in your life. Um, felt as though his dad didn't love him. And unfortunately, Daniel then tried to commit suicide three times. Having grown up watching a lot of World War II films, and we were still in that sort of era, and they showed them regularly, um, and I was very physical in terms of being uh, footballing and rugbying and running around all of the time and always wanted to uh, get involved with the, uh, um, be a soldier. There was a big drive in the west of Scotland to save the Argyles campaign oh. and the Argyles came to my local school and one of the few days I was there they were at the school and yeah I wanted to be part of that, I wanted to be an Argyle. My uncle was in the army and I'd, I've my first holiday was in Germany, in, to an army barracks. I've been to Germany six times to uh, visit visit my uncle and his family. And um, when I was 16, I went to get my GCSE results. They weren't what I expected. I didn't like them, so I just drew, drew straight to the careers office and signed up. <laughs> I went to get my GCSE results when I went I'd signed up to the army. My mum's head fell off, <laughs> basically. I think I was about 15, 16, then I started looking into joining up. Because I come from a big military family anyway. So uh, I've always wanted to join joint forces, always wanted to join army. And then went down to my local army careers office, which they told me, nah, I was a kid, a little bit too young, you need to come back when you're old enough to sign on. And uh, I went to the Leeds branch, signed on there, uh, and I was, yeah, 16, so I was a kid when I joined up. And I thought, well, for people like me who were told you've got no education and you'll never have anything and you'll never be anywhere, I might get some sort of career out of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
with that in mind, I, um, well, I was homeless, actually. At 15, I'd run away from home. And I, was, I slept in Salford by the arches in Salford. Yeah. Uh, and across the arches was the Navy recruiting office. So it just seemed to one day I just got up and walked across the road and uh, started the process. And that was it. I signed up because I was looking for a little bit of adventure, for a better life. Um, the, all the pits were closing in the in the South Wales Valleys and unemployment was quite high. It was 1983, so I uh, joined up in December 83 at HMS Rally and that's where I signed and had my first night in the Royal Navy and a new life. I first had contact with the military when I was 15. I joined the Army Youth Team in uh, the west coast of Scotland area because I was getting in a little bit of bother with those people in uh, blue uniforms. Uh, and I decided that at the tender age of 16.1 to join the army. Prior to that, I did come and have three days with the Royal Navy, but I thought it was a little bit too girly. <laughs> so uh, I went with the army and I, had, I was an apprentice based at the Army Apprentice College in Chepstow. And I joined as a marine engineer and we had two years basic training there and I flourished as a young apprentice. I suddenly had goals and objectives and I really enjoyed the way of life. I then left uh, there and done another 40 year service, uh, regular and reserve. I was working in the aircraft factory. I, was, I had a great job in the aircraft factory. We were making um, uh, man-sized gliders, you know, yeah, for yeah. championships and stuff like that. And um, I was earning £11 a week, which was a lot of a money lot then. Of money, yeah. I joined the army to get £9 a week. Was I keen? Was I keen? What I didn't realise was that you had to set a test. Sat my test, yet the guy said to me, the recruit sergeant says, uh, he was from the Royal Scots, and that was my local regiment in Edinburgh. And at the time, the motto was, join the army and see the world. And that was, that's what I wanted to do. So I sat the test and I come out with some points that had, I could only go so far, yeah. but enough so I didn't have to go to the infantry. Ah, right. So I said to the recruiting sergeant, I said to mate, where can I go with the points that I've got? And he had a big map on the wall of the UK and he pointed the way down to Coventry in England <laughs> and that was, that was a big enough adventure, a 15 year old, uh, that, that sold it for me, I, I, was, I was gone. I wanted to travel, I wanted to travel and I wanted to tell people about the places I was travelling and I wanted to serve my country. The Falklands was in 1982 and it kind of uh, jolted me into uh, thinking, you know, I, I, I'd like to serve my country and I'd seen all these poor guys that were injured and uh, people that lost their lives, you know, uh, uh, within the, the Falklands um, kind of inspired me to, to think, well, you know, that sacrifice there, I could, I could maybe help, you know, and, and maybe be part of that uh, and be proud to serve. And I wanted to be proud of myself because I wasn't proud of myself at that time and I wanted other people to be proud of me. It was coming to the end of school. The army turned up and they had this big display, talked about a lot of these things. I mean, I'd spent my whole life listening to my dad's stories and thought, yeah, that's great. Adventure, that's what I'd like, that's great. So the army came and I thought, right, that's what I want to do, absolutely. I don't, want to, I don't need to think about anything else, that's what I'm going to do. So I was all excited, got home, couldn't wait to get home to see my folks. And my mum was the first one, uh, she was at home at the time. So I went, Mum, guess what I'm going to do? And I told, relayed this whole life plan that I had. And she went, mm, OK. And I said, well, you need to sign the form. And she went, I think you better speak to your father about that first. And it was just really weird because my mum would normally just, she wouldn't be the sort of person that would pass on responsibility. She would sort of say yes or no herself. But she sort of felt that was my dad's area. So my dad came home from work and I thought, oh, pretty good, guess what? I'm going to join the army, yay! And I was giving him all this stuff and my dad just sat there and went, all right. He said, I didn't know you wanted to get your hair cut. And I went, what do you mean? Hey, you've got beautiful hair, why would you want to get a cut? 
And I went, I don't. Well, if you join the army, you'll get your hair cut. Would I? He went, yeah. Um, well, maybe I'll... Oh, it might be worth a sacrifice. I don't know, maybe I'll just, maybe it'll look nice. And he went, I tell you what, when you're 18, you can sign your own death warrant, but I'm not going to sign my child's death warrant. There, there probably was a, a thing to that motivated me more to join as well, was a guy lived two doors from me, and he hung about with my brother, and he was in the UDR, and God rest his soul, he was murdered in 1987, and he was in our house on the Wednesday night, and on the Thursday, he was shot dead, and to be honest again, that was the sort of first, oh my God, how, how bad is this? Why does this happen? And just a, as a young kid then, trying to answer my own questions, was like, this is devastating. Stephen was in my house last night, and now he's not gonna be here no more. Being the first dead body that I'd ever seen, and that gave me a wee bit more motivation too. You know what, when I went to his funeral as well, it was like seeing the guys doing the military funeral, and things like that it was another motivation for me to go, you know what, if it's not for me and my family, yeah, it, it, it's sort of in the memory for Stephen too that I went on to join the forces. We were mixed with Welsh Guards and Scots Guards, you know, but you start early, you build a bond, you know, f from the word go. And that's the part I remember about it, you know. I mean, even if you didn't like someone and you know, you, you'd fought with them or whatever, you know, but the minute you see it, him in town in trouble, you just bail in, it doesn't matter, you know, it's just comradeship. don't like talking to civvies about my military career. Not because... Um, I'm ashamed of it or anything, I'm anything but ashamed of my military career. But civvies, they don't, they don't know. And it's not their fault they don't know. You know, and it was only a week ago I was asked if I, if I ever took life, if I ever killed anybody. By a colleague in work. And I says to him, I gave him the answer I give everyone that asked me that, and I've been asked that on many occasions. You do not have the right to ask me that question. A veteran would never ask me that question. We've got too much respect for each other. We had prepared well. We'd had our, all of our orders. We had about a 10 mile advance to contact uh, through the night. We formed up at the bottom of Mount Longdon. B Company was my company. We were the lead company to take the ridge of Mount Longdon. We had a lot of the youngsters that I spoke about earlier in the film in our company. I remember distinctly our company sergeant major, Johnny Weeks, um, at the bottom of the mountain, got us almost all in single file and asked us to uh, fix bayonets, which was a very bizarre, um, sort of almost going back to your childhood, looking at those films from the 1960s that you'd seen. And, did he just say, fix bayonets? Of which then he said, uh, and I suggest you have a little prayer as well, boys, because... And that was really... When it hit home, we're going up here. We're going into, into battle. There was an airy feeling, really was, and it was like, there was no kids, there was no people, there was no cars, everything, was, not even a dog on the street because the dogs when they seen you just fucking always went for your ankles anyway. And to me then, yeah, this is strange. It's a combat indicator, something could be up here. So from beginning to end of the actual hand-to-hand -hand fighting, it's probably about a good 12, 14 hours before uh, the, the fallback was taken, uh, of which in the meantime, um, we'd lost 23 fellas dead and uh, about over 50 wounded. And uh, it was a case for me personally, lying out forward of fly half with a number of other fellas from uh, six or two, um, and just watching it go raging above our heads, really. The way it ended up 
they were in front of me and they were probably from like no more than 20 metres away, 20 yards away from me and Doogie started come pulling across. As soon as they hit the, the junction of the two sort of alleys, just this fucking place just lit and boom. At the time, it was like the bang, the flash in the bang to be honest, you do see the flash first. I was hit, I, I got fired out from an, uh, an angle coming across from my back left out to my right from a position that was st- we'd overlooked. And I got shot through right by the base of the spine, in the right by me um, um, back hole. <laughs> and so now I got two back holes, and it came out me hip. And what it did, unfortunately, it missed all my bones, but it had hit my sciatic nerve on the way through, and that's what had caused this ruction. And I couldn't, for the life of me, get back on my feet or do anything. And the boss was laying on the ground. I remember Doogie coming in. I grabbed the radio. And we grabbed a piece, each of his chest rig, and we dragged them out of the way, and just a trail of blood. When I eventually got Kazvac, I've got a Kazvac, <laughs> some mates of mine, who uh, cursed and lambasted me for being a lazy week laying around and uh, hogging all of the... T- they lobbed me some blankets from cover and lobbed me them to keep me warm. Um, and I had uh, laid under there. Uh, for a, all these hours, they got me singing because they said to me, don't go to sleep. What do you do? Don't go to sleep because you get hypothermic. Your training has kicked in. Your your sort of medical skills have kicked in. And they say after three, um, what do you call them? First three dressings, it's straight to a tourniquet. Yeah. So it was one and it was soaked two, three. Within within a matter, it wasn't even a minute and the three feed dressings were soaked through with blood. And it was just rifle string, a rifle sling off, bang tourniquet and get them patched up. Don't pee yourself. And I was gagging for a pee. I said, don't, don't do that. It'll bring on hypothermia quicker. They got me to sing songs. Uh, they got me, uh, one of the most point, important things for me was really weirdly, my the choice of song, I was in at the Stranglers big time as well as me, as well as me, um, Scar and stuff like that, and so I was singing a lot of Strangler songs and everything. It's about going on over It's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, Golden Brown had just come out. Um, I'd already been to see him down the uh, Rainbow Theatre and seen that. Wonderful, uh, massive fan of them, singing Strangler songs. And then moved on to, weirdly enough, change the tempo, and as I got more and more hacked off, on the Simon, Simon and Garfunkel. It severed his femoral artery, and at the time, we weren't aware of yeah. the full damage. His quadrant and stuff had been, had been tore off and what have you. So at the time, there was just, a, just that buzz feeling, yeah. adrenaline rush, and we got to the hospital. He went into the emergency ward to get treated right away, and they brought us, we had no, we had no physical, mm-hmm. physical injuries, but the wee nurse said, go use in there, Get yourselves cleaned up. I knew they was really taking a mick, like when they started shouting out requests from Fly Off, you know what I mean? Like, oh, bloody hell, you know. And it was like pre karaoke days at the time, like, was, yeah, you am it, old strum it. And, <laughs> <laughs> so, but they were very true members. And, and that, I mean, Joan's like, that's what gets you through that, just little things like that, you know. I wasn't aware of what state I was in with blood or anything like that. I was just like, I had no gloves on because I had to rip my gloves off and what have you. I knew my hands had blood on them. But went into the wee board and standing, the nurse said, Go ahead, get yourselves cleaned up. And then started, and I hadn't looked in the mirror at this stage, and it's just starting to wipe clean my hands. And then I looked in the mirror, and just my face was just plastered, fully in blood. And next thing, I was woke up on a bed. I just, boom, I just coped it. And that was the end of the adrenaline rush, probably yeah. at the same yeah. time. Like where you go overloaded on adrenaline. Yeah. And you've got to go down. The big massive sleep. down. And yeah. it just, I flaked that I was out cold. The cloud cover cleared and Sir Galahad run in and the Argentinians from the mountains went, ah, there's two big grey ships there and they're not protected. So that was the most significant point and w- probably the start of post-traumatic stress. Uh, within four minutes, we had 55 killed and 138 injured. And it's the burning. It, 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 we had waterproofs then that would melt into you. You know, we didn't have good kit. 
uh, that was the most significant time. And as a young lance corporal, I had to go out and rescue some of these guys, and we rescued over 100 people. Yeah, my mate got hit with an IED right in front of me in, fe in February 2010. He stood on a wooden IED and lost both his legs. And I was a Cat C casualty. I, I got hit in the face with shrapnel. Right. And when, so how long were you there for? I got there in September. Yeah. And we'd seen a lot of action, we'd seen a lot of contacts, and we'd seen a lot of IEDs. I'd dug one up, in fact, with a trap with my tractor. It just didn't go off because it was wet. I was just had seen it hanging off and just reversed off. Um, and then it was just, it got to February and he just stood on one. Just with an IED, can't even find it with the metal detectors. So that was quite hard. Anything painful that sticks out in your memory that maybe just, I know probably quite a lot, but is there anything specific that uh, makes you stand still for a minute and just reflect? It, mainly when children have been hurt, like out in Sierra Leone, I was involved with the, uh, the West Side boys when they used to get cracked up and drugged up and drunk and, and they'd go out and cut kids' hands and and, and feet off and the aftermath of that was pretty significant and and again down in Angola you know uh, the, the 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 kids coming in with mind strikes you know with legs missing and things like that was was quite quite naughty the 500 pound car bomb in Spencer Road yeah. probably started it for me uh, but me not realizing it because you suck it up and you, you know, you get on with it. Next day, you're back out in the street. You can't let your guys down. You can't show any sign of weakness. And then there was times in St John Street where we were fully on fire through the petrol bombs. I lifted my, my shield to protect, but it came off the top of my shield and hit my mate on the side of the helmet. And we had the old helmets then. Of course, the bottle broke engulfed me down the left hand side but his whole head was completely on fire. Sometimes I drive to Sarajevo, sometimes I drive to um, Split, um, which is about, so you're talking about six, seven hour drives and they're, you know, just there and do whatever I had to do when I was there and then drive back. Uh, but the most important thing was to make sure you never switched off at any point. You couldn't, like even now in Sydney Street, if you sort of drift off, you might brush a curb. You can't do that in Bosnia. You could hit a landmine. It was an experience. Sometimes you saw people who hated you. Sometimes you saw people who would look at you with so much hate that it would make your stomach clench because you'd think, God, you really would just destroy me if you could. And then you get people that would come out of their homes or shops and like a woman shut her door in a shop and I thought, what the hell's going on? Uh, it was a little local shop we would go to, and she held both my hands and thanked me for being there. Just thanked us for keeping her safe, and it told us that she slept better because she knew we were there. And I kind of related a lot to what she said, because I remember my time in Ireland when I lived there, and obviously with the terrorists and all that, knowing the police and army were there, it did make you sleep better. You know, and I had one incident when there was a little kid You're right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's over my life. Don't feel. Don't say anything you don't feel you want to say. Do no, you? no, no. That's cool. No, this little kid. He was starving. He'd lost his family. Oh, you weren't allowed to do anything. Feed him or, or anything. I couldn't bear it. I'll probably get into trouble for even saying this now. But I used to chuck my lunchbox out the window so we could have it. Because I knew where I was going, I'd get fed. But this little poor little bugger, I look at him and he just reminded me of me when I lived in Ireland. That desperate look, that empty look he had in his eyes, that he's seen some terrible stuff. There was a car that exploded and it drifted across the road and crashed into a wall. And when, when we arrived at the, the incident, the passenger door was opening and banging against the wall and uh, as it turned out it was a guy we knew we called him Fred Anthony and his official title was he was a, cl a cleaner in Lurgan police station but he was a lovely man 
but he did a bit of everything, you know, he hoovered police cars out and things like this. He's just a handy man, really, but he's a lovely man and that attacked him. Uh, but he had his family in the car and his wife was really badly burnt, cradling, cradling the daughter in, in, in the back of the car. And we pulled the car away from the wall to get daughter out. The wife was really badly burnt uh, and Fred was cutting half. Sorry, so take your time, mate. Back to the time. But the overriding memory memory for me of that was his daughter's slippers had been blown out the back of the car and were in the road, and it was like somebody would sitting there. It, it, it was it was staggering to see that they could land like that, you know. Anyway, uh, the, the incident went on, but what really did me was the car he was driving. It was a blue Skoda Estelle. I had actually sold him it because old Freddie didn't earn a lot, you know, and I was getting a newer car and I offered him it and I sold him it and I always wondered, was it for me or was it for him? And okay. of course, we'll never know, will we? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. You okay to carry on? Yeah, yeah just a sec. Yeah, not a problem, take your time. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Thank you. We had a lot of kids on that, well, we had a lot of kids on subsequent Afghan tours that uh, burnt out on nasty burns. I, I didn't like the burns, I really didn't like the burns. You used to go in, you know, you go in for your ITU shift on the ward. And uh, the typical ward shift is, you know, you go in for the, you know, if you say you're on the early shift, you go in, you have your hand over. And, uh, Uh, they hand over all the patients to the oncoming shift and uh, I think we had about 10 beds, 10, 10 intensive care beds, which is a large number for a hospital to have. Um, and um, if we had, if we were full up and we had so maybe five or six burns and four or five children and a couple of soldiers with wounds, Whoever was in charge of the shift would be like, you know, say, have you got any preference, your patients you want to look after? You know, because it should, intensive care should have been one-to-one -one if we had correct staffing levels. Um, and a lot of my colleagues didn't want to look after the children, but I didn't want to look after the burns. No. Oh. Um, so I always jumped up and said, I'll look after the kids. And some really small children there with um, what's, it was called peppering. Um, peppering was it looks like someone's got a big pepper grinder and just scattered it over somebody. All it is is um, lots of tiny bits of shrapnel and dirt that's been blasted into them. Um, and you look at these children, they just be covered in tiny fragments of metal and sometimes some big injuries. Um, just a lot of shitty, dirty weeds, really. Just everything was dirty. I say everything was dirty. <laughs> All the wounds were vile, mm. uh, and uh, it was the only time in my entire nursing career that I've actually turned around and vomited at the sight of something. You know, and I've you know I've been a no, what's it today in twenty nineteen I've been a nurse for thirty four years. Was there a a particular deployment or incident that triggered your mental health condition? And only answer if you're comfortable. Um, I seen my first fatalities. Yeah, eighteen years of age. I was prepared, as I thought, to see um, dead bodies. Of course, you know, I'd never seen a dead body before, uh, and I'd certainly never seen parts of bodies. Yeah. Um, my first bombing was. Horrific. First shooting was horrific. And, uh, yeah. Anything that involves innocence. So, when you actually left the, the armed forces, I mean, how did you find that transition from 
sort of being a you know a, a squaddy to a city and, and when did you actually leave it was it was <laughs> it was really really difficult in fact it was terrible to be fair uh, because i was a brigade brigade warrant officer working down in bearsbrook mill uh, in charge of the alley fleet and i drove the day i left the army in 2003 i drove from bearsbrook mill down to the docks at belfast onto a ferry and home and that night i was at my mum's so me leaving the army it, it was just a complete body blow to me. One morning, I was in the army in charge of a, I don't know, multi-million pound heli fleet. And that night, I was sat at my mum's and I wasn't in the army. They happened fast. I think it was to do with being such a fast pace in the army. And I weren't sort of ready to come out the army. It wasn't my choice. It was an injury. So... It was very fast paced to coming out to do an absolute zero and that amount of time with the amount of th th memories and things like that, it just it it all it just spilled out. The whole thing spilled out. The drink then just got and it was a on epic proportions. I couldn't go to the shop and buy a bottle of wine for us to share for a meal. I'd be buying my partner a bottle of wine and I'd be buying six. I'd be buying a bottle of vodka with it and things like that. And I'd be I'd start hiding around the house and being deceitful about it. And as much as I thought I was being very covert about the tree, I said, you're exactly what I was doing. We got to a point where we drinking binges I was coming home from working abroad and me drinking binges were going on for days and days and days. And we decided to try, didn't wait to try and save the relationship was for me to move out. So I got my own place. And that was, I believe, was a, it might have saved, just saved the relationship, however. It was a decision I made, but from that day, it was just a massive no nosedive. I was by myself, I was lonely, and I just literally went on to major self-destruct. I took myself, to, took my dog, it's seven o'clock at night, just getting dark, and I went to the shop, and I bought a big stupid bottle of cider, 7.5%, three litres or so, and I took the dog down to a beauty spot near us called Frog, Frog Island. It's a big pool and it's secluded and there's a bench there and I intended to drink half of it until I was drunk, put my feet in the water, drink the rest until I fell over. Um, I thought, how's the dog going to get home? How stupid. So, of course, you're taking the tablets and you're drinking heavily, you know, then the screams in the night the night sweats, you know, that's why I say sleep is overrated. It's because I didn't sleep that much. Um. I was diagnosed about four years ago, but before that I was having um, night terrors, night sweats. Um, I'd cry myself to sleep. I'd go upstairs and isolate myself. Um, I'd hide behind the bed and just sob my eyes out. Um, I didn't want my kids seeing me like that. I certainly didn't want my wife seeing me like that. Um, and I would just, I, I didn't want friends, I didn't want people around me, I didn't socialise. I kept busy. I don't have a first degree, I joined the army, so I went and done a master's, then a doctorate, on top of all these jobs. So I noticed things weren't, I was, classic avoidance, okay, full on, everyone but me. So I started getting, eventually, my own physical and certainly my physical, psychological well-being was significantly impacted. Uh, but I didn't see it because I was me and invincible. But actually, I was quite ill and very ill, actually. So much so that it was four or five times a day, I'd think, I'm not worth it, I'll just jog on and take my life. So that was quite... I knew something wasn't right, but how could I possibly be this uh, non-resilient? Uh, you know, people were coming to me for advice all the time, especially as I'd walked through the ranks. You know, out in Iraq, the guys used to say to me, boss, we want to go out with you today because you'll get us back. Well, I'd put them in very high-risk situations, but I'd get them all back, good soldiering. But, uh, but I knew there was something wrong, you know. So in 2012, I, 
when we came back from a party and uh, I was very socially confused and my wife uh, made a mistake in the car and, I th and the next day I, uh, I said, you know, I just wanted to ram the car into the wall. But I wouldn't with her in it, but I had no regard for my own health or, or life and no consequences. And then I started thinking about different ways to end my life. So I knew there was something wrong. From 1984 to 2011 and it wasn't until 2015 that I got to confront my first trauma right. and I'd bottled it up all that time. 22nd of January last year uh, is where everything sort of went wrong for me. Um, as I've been told I had a, a mental block uh, I basically walked out on my family. I went to watch my son do his sports day. Come back home with my partner at the time. Sat down and um, just staring at the telly. Uh, my partner turned around to me and said, hey, I'm going to go pick Bobby up. And I just couldn't focus, couldn't think straight. I just packed my car and I went. And I just did myself away for nearly a year. I didn't talk to anybody, didn't go out. When I went to see my son, it was like giving my son a love was like giving a, a rock or a, a piece of iron a love. I was just cold, I had no feeling of love, emotion, care. I wasn't bothered. Um, I just felt worthless. I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't want to be near anybody. I felt like I wasn't worth anything. In my eyes, I tried, I tried hanging myself because I didn't want to be in home at all. I didn't want to, I didn't want to put the pressure on my family, on my sons. I don't have enough. My son, my son nearly saw me on himself. Within six months of Craig being in Germany, realising the damage it caused, he then, out of the blue, said, I want a divorce. Um, it didn't surprise me, because the cracks were already there. And it was just so easy at that point for me to go, okay. Because I'd seen the damage to the kids. I'd seen the damage to the children. And, and I, I, I suppose I blame myself. Should I have moved the children out? When my friends told me all them years ago, would Daniel have got to the point he got to? If I'd walked away, that was years ago. But I believe my husband's still in there. So I went home, went into my parents, and they knew something was up, and I didn't open up to them. And they went, what's wrong? I mean, nothing, I'm OK, I'm fine. You, are you sure? And it was just me, I'm fine, I'll be okay. Eventually I did tell them what had happened and they were fuming. And they said, are you going to do anything? Then they did say, are you going to do anything silly? Here's me, no. I mean, I'm not planning on anything silly. So they took my meds away, whatever meds it was on, because they thought, you yeah. might be daft enough to try this again. But 
I'd planned something else in my head without telling them, so they left me be for a while in the room and started sorting out my stuff in the room. The room wasn't the room wasn't a mess, but to me, I need to tidy, I need to get everything set away, set out. Done all that, and the last thing I was doing was my wallet. Opened my wallet and I went right, set it out on the bed, and I just started lay, laying cards out, any bank cards, my driving license, and. The last one came out was combat stress and I looked at this card and I sat and I went, this has happened for a reason, I need to phone this number. So on December 15, I phoned the number and from there, my journey began. I used to think that this was about being embarrassed, about not being a man, that sort of thing, about the stigma that was out there. What I've learned, actually, there's no stigma out there. The stigma's inside ourselves. We, we create this ourselves. I didn't feel I had any worth and value, but we all have worth and value all of us, each and every single one of us. Uh, and it's only when you realise that we do have value, and it's okay to say that, that you then start opening doors. When did you first contact Combat Stress? When did that, from the 25th anniversary of the Falklands yeah. to when, what, how long was it before you got in touch I with Combat So I first contacted them, I had a chat, come on, come around. So I reckon, I think my first, assessment down there would have been 2008, late 2008. Um, and that was something else. Because really, all of that, you're unsure. You are unsure. Self-diagnosis is not an easy thing on anything. However, when you've got, again, a very set of core values, and you have got to say, well, am I, am I showing weakness here? You've got to face up to that. And so you're the last person, you really are, as a veteran, the last person qualified to tell yourself whether you're all right or you're not all right. Because invariably, and I've heard this story so, so, so many times, that I'm all right. People with PTSD have these symptoms here. Oh, really? Shit. <laughs> People with PTSD have this behaviour here. Oh, okay, all right. So again, acceptance, and said you need to come straight in. So in the march, I went in. And I would say that one thing I would say in hindsight, or reflect on is, the quicker you accept it and the quicker you engage, the more you'll get out of it. And that's one regret I have, because I never told the the psychologist, everything, I had to, that trust wasn't there. And I wasn't ready to tell them how ill I was because it was my private little moment. It was me that had to deal with it. And I knew I'd have to get myself better anyway and they were going to help me. But uh, it was, uh, that's the only thing I, I regret. The six weeks was intense. That intense, when you put ITP, you should put intense in big capital letters. See, I was coming to a crossroads again because I haven't, it's like, get, well, going to combat stress is one thing, then learning or getting all the stuff in your toolbox, but going away and not working on yourself is, is like shooting yourself in the foot. I went into art therapy thinking I was having a break. Mm. And the therapist, she said, drop what you think right now. You've got 40 minutes or so, 30 minutes. And I drew myself from the back, and I always do this when, it, when, when, I, when I get flashbacks. I see myself from behind. It's a, it's a different me. I'm looking at me with PTSD, and I'm not. You know, so that makes sense. Yeah, it does, yeah. I saw myself standing on a tightrope, and I used to be quite good at that. I was standing on a tightrope from the back, and below me, below the tightrope, I had written anxiety, self-harm, depression, suicidal thoughts, all the symptoms. And then I drew a safety net and combat stress. So, Christ, 
And that's when I realise that safety net's not there all the time. Mm. You've got to take from this what they're teaching you. Mm. If I hadn't have drawn that, I wouldn't have had a light bulb moment, to be honest. And that's I, brilliant. I, I, didn't, I, I don't really know what would have happened. If I'd have soaked everything in the, the way I did after, after drawing that, and, and it's that realisation that it's not there all the time. Mm. They're teaching you to manage your, your, your mental health. What would you say to veterans who aren't sure whether to call combat stress for help? I would say, look at their self, look at their family, and look at the situation that you're in, and make sure that you ask for help and be prepared to do a little bit of work. When I first started therapy, it wasn't working. I couldn't speak, it, speak about anything. I tried a therapy called CBT. Didn't, I couldn't, couldn't speak. So I was put on to EMDR. That allowed me to speak about things. It was very hard, but once I could get them out, then I could go back onto the CBT start processing some things, like, that's cool. Um, once you do that, then the art therapy and things like that, all that, everything helps, everything joins in together and it, it clears your mind. It, so a bit of everything actually works. The um, CBT therapy was, was frightening. Cried that much, I had that many flashbacks. Doing EMDR, that was a, like an out-of-body experience. <clears throat> and then doing graded exposure with the OT and all the things that they've taught me with, you know, graded exposure, um, coping mechanisms, you know, realising that was then, this is now. So there's quite a chunk. And then I sit here today as part of the peer support volunteers which who would have thought back in 2012 I would ever get the pleasure of wearing a combat stress lanyard yeah. with my little ID card and working for the peer support volunteers because it's like self-therapy. I think they call it like um, post-traumatic growth. Mm. Um, so having the PTSD... I think has also made a massive impact on my life because I don't think I'd be where I am now if I hadn't had the PTSD. Yeah. So it, it, it sort of, it's even though it nearly took my, my, my life twice, mm. it, it, it's given me this big opening in my life now and working with peer support, you know, as a volunteer is great because, you know, you get to give something back and help other veterans. And to me, that's that's all I want to do now is, I just hope one person, one veteran, could get the help that I've had, you know, and hopefully that will save a veteran's life. Everything, through all combat sets and all that, I do, because it's focusing on the worst points behind a career, things like that, I would like to say it's not Everything was bad. It's you're working on all the bad things, but when you think about it, yeah, I actually have more good times than bad times. But you do sort of forget about them because the worst just comes out now. But if you stop and think and remember the times, like when you go to combat tests and you wait other veterans, you start remembering. I used to have a laugh most days. It's like it's it's really it. Getting back with the veterans, that's a massive help, it really is. I'd particularly like to say if there are any officers out there who, because I know that we feel, as probably everybody does, but there's a certain embarrassment about it and the, and the sense that you have to be something different, and that's rubbish. I nearly said something, something else. So we can all ask for help.
I also use an analogy I've used here. Um, dry stone wall. Uh, I had a dry, I've got a dry stone wall in the house in Dunoon and it fell down and it fell down it was, it had fallen down for about five years and I, every time I looked at this wall it was beating me because I couldn't, I seen it as a just a, a step too far so basically my wife she put me on a course dry stone wall for a weekend that was to, I don't know, what, just, you know, try and fix the wall. But I knew it was too difficult for me to do. Anyway, when I come here, I was asked in the art department to do all this. Uh, to, I was painting dark things, red things, you know. But now I'm quite, I, I found them a little bit, not talented, but I've got a, I've got a flair for looking at things from a different perspective. Now I've, uh, I use the wall, you've got to have good foundations and then all the other little bits, bigger, bigger, bigger rocks are leaning on between two rocks to, you know, make a good foundation and then it's all the little bits that you fill in round about those stones. Sometimes the smaller things are more important. Than the, the, than the bigger things. And that, that wall, what, I say to my, what I've said to my son now, that wall, as long as you've got good foundations and you're not bringing it, etc., etc., um, and you're schooling and you're, uh, you've got a job, etc., all those foundations and then build on them. And life is like that. And sometimes you'll have a wobble, sometimes it'll fall down. All you've got to do is pick yourself up, rearrange them, put them back. He's frightened of who he is and what he and where he is, and he's frightened of the person he begins. He's frightened in case he doesn't find the Craig that I love and that I know and the the, the, the kid's dad. He, he, he's frightened of the journey he's on. But but, yeah. but, but, but even so, he's getting help. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and making those steps. Yeah. How did he find out about combat stress? Again, through his friends. Uh -huh. um, some of his friends had been through combat stress. So it's, and again, after retirement, you know, off the go, and it's through, you stick to each other friends through Facebook. And a few of the boys have actually put on there saying, I finally feel as well, I've put my bergen down. That's the terminology they're using. Put my bergen down finally come home um, and it's only through that that I've you know I've pushed and pushed and I've said please ring them please ring them please ring them and it was only in that that stage where he'd had the breakdown he came back and said yeah I need to ring them I'm going to ask you a very different question where were you yesterday I had a great enough run right okay why running this year for combat stress and is the uh, the first time you'd done it? Second, the second year. The second year. And uh, did you train? Or was it just <laughs> Not this year, I haven't trained. St straight in there? <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So can you tell us why it's important for you to run for combat stress? I ran, I ran it because really it's for my dad. I have to relive it every day, every night, and it's it's hard, but you've got to learn to push through it, and you've just got to deal with it, and hopefully you you've got somebody strong who's at side in you while you're doing it. And for nearly eight years, I had nobody strong at side of me. I was having to deal with it all on my own. I 
I got in touch with Combat Stress for a friend and I learned I weren't alone. And I call this the PTSD stay. Does anybody care? Would anyone dare? Nerves on edge, too much to bear. Partner doesn't know if you're ill or well. Tiptoeing round on eggshells. She tries to talk, but you know best. Stop nagging, give it a rest. She breaks down, as do you. I've had enough, what can we do? I knock at the door. Who can that be? Hello mate, long time no see. Eyes red raw, throat so sore. I know this guy, we've spoken before. I am the guy that will dare. I will show you that we do care. There we go. Would you like any more? So that's it, buddy. That, that's it all done and dusted. We're finished. Cheers, mate. I want to be an Argyle, and I want to be the best Argyle I can be. And I still carry it this day, the pride of my regiment. Of course I do. Yeah. I'm not a veteran, I'm an Argyle. I'm not an ex-anything, I'm an Argyle. I'm not an ex-soldier, an ex squaddy or ex-Argyle. My, I'm in your face if you call me that. Strangest place when I think about it, which I only thought about it just now. Um, on top of the control tower in Baz Airport in Iraq. Actually on top of the control tower. The control tower was used as an aiming marker for Iraqis firing mortars, which, thinking about it now, is not the best place to set up an OP. <laughs> Oh, do you have a brew? <laughs> yeah. If you do, you've got to have a brew off, haven't you? No matter where you are, you've got to, you can't. No one in the army can't move without T.O. in it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the strangest place I've ever brewed up was digging the latrines in Rhine's Island in Germany. And I was digging the latrines, and I just sat down, got my brew kit out, and having a brew and the lads were coming along to, you know, do their business, drop the kids off. Yeah, yeah. And they were going, you're not normal, Herbie. What's the matter with you? And I said, why, what's up? Well, I need to have a, a dump. <laughs> well, carry on, don't worry about me. You yeah. know, we, we've all seen it before. Uh, and I just sat there having a brew, you know, and then you live in a drain, you carry on then, don't you? You just yeah, yeah. do your job. <laughs> The Marines don't brew, they make a wet. So that's the first thing, okay? So the Army make brews, the Marines or the Naval Service make wets. So the strangest place I've made a wet is in uh, a marble-lined toilet in one of Saddam's palaces in northern Iraq with a gold throne.
If you are a veteran or a family member and have been affected by this film, call the Combat Stress 24 hour helpline on 0800 138 1619.